Well, I've had several requests lately for me to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So today, I want us to look closely at scriptures now and see the scriptural basis for the baptism. Now, hopefully, this is going to answer some questions that you may have. And in addition, I'm hoping you'll mark these scriptures down in your Bible because these will equip you for answering questions for other people uh, because there's other people that are needing answers. And uh, if, if you'll just write this down, put it in your Bible and not be in, in any kind of fear, you can leave them in the baptism. And that's what we're wanting. Now, first, I want us to cover some of the questions about the baptism that are most often asked, because sometimes we have a lot of people calling and they'll ask us these different questions. And then the next time, we're going to look at nine of the values or the advantage of the prayer tongue, because it has so many advantages. God made two love promises, and I've always loved the fact that he, he just kind of broke it in two, and it covers everything. But the first love promise is in John 3.16, for God... Uh, uh, for the fact that God was going to send a Savior who was going to take our sins on his own body on the cross so that we could escape the eternal hellfire that uh, is coming for the people that don't receive Jesus. And um, the second promise is in the last part of Luke 3.16 that he will baptize us in his Holy Spirit and in fire. Now, all through the Word, you're going to see references now to the promise of the Spirit. Uh, sometimes it'll say the promise of the Father. But whenever you see the promise of the Spirit or the promise of the Father, it's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, most of us have memorized Galatians 3.13. I memorized that a long time ago. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, because it's so powerful that we're no longer under a curse. You know, when we think about it, that Christ redeemed us, we're no longer under a curse. All those curses we read in the Old Testament, we're no longer under those curses because of what Christ did. But we don't need to stop there because anytime I was reading Galatians 3.13, I would just be so thankful. Lord, I thank you. You've redeemed us from the curse of the law. And I would usually stop and move on to something else. But most people don't realize that we need to keep reading there in verse 14 because it says he redeemed us from the curse so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit. And, you know, I mean, I'd left that out for so many years that I didn't notice that it, it gave me more. I was so excited about being redeemed from the curse that I didn't really stop to realize that it was so that he could give us the promise of the Spirit. Okay, now why he redeemed us is so that we could have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's read the whole thing. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, or everyone who hangs on the cross, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might then receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. And I remember the first time that I read a little further in that verse, I got so excited saying, oh my goodness, I was leaving out a huge promise right there at the end. Now, we were redeemed from the curse, and the reason was so that we'd be eligible then to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, too many times people quit reading in Galatians 3.13 too soon, and they miss this powerful promise. Okay, so I want you to take note of this. The first promise is John 3.16. And it's uh, for his life to come in us to change our destiny from hell to heaven, from death to life forevermore. And that's what he's telling us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's our promise that he gives us in John 3, 16. And this promise was made possible by giving us a redeemer so that uh, through him, through Christ, we could escape hell and live eternally with him. Now, that is the promise for the next life. John 3.16 is for the next life. But we have a Luke 3.16. Uh, one promise is 3.16, Luke, John 3.16. One is Luke 3.16. And it makes uh, the, these references easy to remember. But we need to realize these two scriptures cover everything in this life and cover everything in the life to come. Now, this second promise is to redeem us from the curse, number one, and to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. So this second promise is to give us power to live victoriously on this earth. So we've got one for heaven and one for this earth. Now, these two promises are simply God saying, I've got you covered in this life with Luke 3.16, and I've got you covered in the life to come with John 3.16, if, if we'll just choose the way that he's provided. 
So we need both of these promises in order to live victoriously in this life and to have life everlasting then eternally with him. Now, these two scriptures, really, they, they're all we need. They cover everything that we need for earth and everything that we need for heaven. But we don't need a, a soldier in battle without first going to boot camp, uh, even in the natural. We don't send a soldier into battle until we actually first put him through boot camp so he can learn how to use the equipment that he's been given. Well, it's exactly the same thing for us in the spiritual realm. With these two promises in John 3.16 and Luke 3.16, we've been given all the equipment that we need for this life and for the life to come. But... Uh, we, we don't want them to go to waste by not realizing what God has given us. We need to see these promises and realize, God, you did this, so I need to take them and put them to work. Uh, now, too often, Christians live under poor lives because uh, they receive that first promise, they accept Jesus as their Savior, uh, and they think that they have everything. They think they received it all that's being offered, and so they stop short. We have to come to a place where we determine we're not going to stop short. Now, let me show it to you in Scripture. Back in John 20, verse 19, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, uh, this is right after he had just been resurrected from the dead, and the Bible says that he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this happened probably the first day after he was resurrected. Now, too many Christians stop there when they receive the Lord, and they say, well, he breathed on me, and I've received the Holy Spirit, so I have the Holy Spirit now. Well, uh, this first receiving of the Holy Spirit took place on the inside of that person. And when they saw that he had been resurrected from the dead and they received his spirit into them and Jesus breathed on them and actually told them, receive my spirit. So they got born again. Now that means that their spirit man came alive on the inside. And at that moment, their destiny was changed from literally changed from hell to heaven at that moment. But a lot of Christians don't realize that it really didn't stop there. They just think, oh, I've got it all. But it didn't stop there. Now, the reason the Holy Spirit uh, did this for them, in Acts 1, verse 3, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and speaking things concerning the kingdom of God. Then he gathered them together and he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard about it from me. So once they receive that spirit, they need to realize in Acts 1-3, it's telling us, don't stop, don't wait, don't stop there. You've got more to come. In other words, he said, this is not due to you. I told you about it. I told you to wait for it. And then he went on explaining, just as John baptized with water, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the Lord, he, he put the spirit in them there in John, but he he said, it's not over. That's not all there is. And uh, he was letting them know that in 40 days, it was going to happen just exactly like he promised. And uh, because he said, not many days from now. And it was only 40 days later. Now, as a reminder, I want to point out here that they had already received the Holy Spirit the first day when he first appeared to them after his resurrection. But now, after having been with them for 40 days, he now is commanding them here in verse 4, to wait until they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing how many Christians don't go on and read this second half. They take the first half, but, but they stop and they don't read the rest. They don't take in the rest. And I want you to notice that he didn't suggest that they wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He actually commanded them to wait, even though they had already received the Holy Spirit on the inside. The first day that they saw him, uh, but basically he was saying, don't stop. There's more to come. Okay, now he's letting us know right here that the baptism in the Holy Spirit that he's telling us to wait for is a separate experience from receiving the Holy Spirit now uh, when they first got born again. It's two separate experiences. Receiving the Holy Spirit now, it happens on the inside. A person at that point moves from death to life because of what happened on the inside. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus commanded us to wait for, was an experience that was going to give them power to be a witness and introduce Jesus to the world. It's something that happens on the outside. Acts 1.8, at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Okay, now when we receive the Holy Spirit on the inside, 
at the new birth experience. He's on the inside and he's changing our destiny from hell to heaven. I mean, this is something, this is shouting ground, you know. But at the baptism of the Holy Spirit now, his Holy Spirit comes on the outside of us to make us a bold witness. One happens on the inside, one happens on the outside. And you can go to heaven with that first experience, you know, uh, when you get born again, because your spirit man is now alive and you now belong to the Lord. You belong to Jesus. But if we want to have a powerful witness, if we want to get people saved, if we want to make a difference in this world, we have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which comes as a second experience. Now, it's so sad to me that so many Christians fight so hard to refuse this second experience. I, I, I can't even imagine how many people just say, I've got all, I don't want any, don't tell me anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't want that. And I've had people actually turn me off and say no. Uh, but it's amazing, I don't know what they do with that scripture that says Jesus commanded them to get it. Okay, why do we fight so adamantly when it's a gift from God that's going to give us the power to be successful, to be a successful witness uh, for him? Why do we do that? Well, some of my saddest memories are good Christian friends of mine who truly loved God, and they wanted to go, and, and they wanted to be a witness. They even went overseas to witness for Jesus, get people saved. Yet they came home broken and devastated and defeated. And I've seen that happen so many times because they went out without the power and the devil almost devastated them. But it wasn't God's fault. He had plainly commanded them to wait for the baptism before they went out. The devil is not powerless against us. He actually is the God of this world. But that's why we have to have God's power on the outside now uh, to give us what we need to win. We have to have that power. Now, one couple who went as missionaries, uh, they went without the power of the Holy Spirit, and they were really close friends of ours. We'd gone to church together, and we begged them not to go into the mission field without the baptism, but they didn't believe us. They, they said, no, we got it all. I, you know, that, I don't know, they didn't even know where we were coming from. And I can't even begin to describe the devastation when they returned. You know, she's alone now, you know, and she won't even return our calls. I think they realize that they did it wrong, but they're still not willing to say, we, she's not willing to say we made a mistake. Now, it's ironic that in spite of Jesus making it so clear that we have to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that churches will send out laymen, uh, they'll send out pastors, they'll send out missionaries, unprepared and unequipped to do the work of the ministry. And it's all because our churches have not taught about this second promise in, in uh, Acts 1 verse 5, the promise of the Spirit that would give us the power to be able to operate in the world. And because of Christians not being taught to wait for it, we've seen so much, much devastation. You know, uh, discouraged pastors. We see missionaries uh, back from the mission field. And just like the testimony that I just gave. And they're devastated. And they don't know what they've done wrong because they said, I went to, to take Jesus to the world. Why didn't it work? They're devastated because they didn't have the equipment they needed to be able to operate now in, in the authority that God wanted to give them. Now, it's totally unscriptural to leave off this second promise. Christians have missed it for so many years, but God now is bringing the truth alive concerning the importance of the Holy Spirit baptism. We're hearing it from the pulpits now more than we've ever heard it before. Now, many times I've heard Christians question, why is it that we need the baptism? Okay, let me ask you, would you say that Jesus was the Son of God from the time he was born? You know, I don't think anyone would argue with that. Would you say that he was filled with the Spirit uh, while he was very young? We know at age 12, he was in the temple. He was teaching the, the doctors, and they were astonished at his wisdom. And he said, I have to be about my father's business. He recognized his father. He recognized his ministry at age 12. And yet, even though uh, he was already the Son of God, even though he was already walking in the Spirit, we see that Jesus had a second experience himself. Before he entered his public ministry, he was water baptized, and at that time the sky opened and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And that's when the Holy Spirit then uh, literally covered him. Now there's a reason for the order in which these two promises came. 
A person has to receive Jesus first in his heart to be born again, which gives us our ticket to heaven. And again, that was what we read about in John chapter 20 when Jesus first rose from the grave, told his disciples to receive his Holy Spirit, and that's when he breathed on them. Then in Acts 2, 33, after Jesus having been exalted to the right hand of the Father, after his 40 days on earth, received from the Father in heaven the promise of the Holy Spirit, and then he poured out his Holy Spirit on his disciples on the day of Pentecost. Now, at this point, he was in, in heaven with the Father. He, he waited to send the Holy Spirit until he was in heaven with the Father. Verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, was poured forth this which you both see and hear. Okay, now I want us to see that what was poured out on his disciples is not something to receive if we happen to decide, well, whether I want it or not. Some people, they say, I don't know whether I want the baptism. And, and they'll be questioning, you know, uh, whether they think they need it or whether they want it. Listen, this is something Jesus commanded us to have. He didn't give us a choice. And just like we don't send a soldier into battle without his first going to the boot camp to, to learn how to use the equipment that's being issued to him, there is a tremendous power that we receive at the baptism, but we have to learn how to use it. it, it it's something where God says, I, I, I want to give it to you, and then I, I want you to learn from me exactly how to use it. Now, if Jesus saw the need for a second experience, how much more do we need to get it? Now, one of the most common errors that I hear from people who have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they'll say, well, after I got the Holy Spirit. And what they're really meaning is after I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because they already had the Holy Spirit in, on the inside when they were saved. It's two experiences, and that what, that's what throws people off. Now, this is a serious error in our theology, because every born-again child has the Holy Spirit. We couldn't be born again without the Spirit. But not every born-again child has the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, another word for baptism is immersion, to be covered over with the Spirit. And it's possible to be filled on the inside with the Spirit and yet not be immersed or not be baptized in the Spirit. Now, Jesus described both of these experiences in the book of John. And that's why Jesus referred to the baptism as a clothing in Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, wait until you're clothed from on high. Now, clothing is worn on the outside. The disciples had already had the Holy Spirit breathed into them. But he said, after that, you wait until it becomes a clothing, until you wear it on the outside. Now, this is important. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit daily over and over. But the Holy Spirit baptism is a one-time experience. You know, so we need to realize that. We need to be filled over and over and over with the, with the Holy Spirit, uh, just exactly that they received it in on John 20. But this Holy Spirit baptism now is a one-time experience, and uh, uh, this is what makes the notable change in a person once they've received the baptism. Now, most people find that it brings a new boldness to be a witness. Now, the scriptures begin uh, to take on a whole new meaning once a person receives the baptism. And unless a person is dealing with the spirit of fear, most people never again doubt their salvation once they've had the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And you see the real difference that it makes now in the life of Peter. Before he was baptized, he was hiding from the Jews. Uh, he knew what was happening to Jesus, and he was in love with the Lord, and yet he was still hiding. He was afraid. But after the day of Pentecost, we find him fearlessly preaching to everyone with whom he came in contact and he preached in the streets of Jerusalem, and 5,000 came to the Lord. That's the day when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Now, Peter no longer feared what man could do to him. After the baptism, it, it, it takes that fear away, and it, it brings a boldness in place of it. And that was the difference that the baptism made in his life. Now, we find in Acts 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the 120 in the upper room, that one of the evidences now that came with the baptism is that they all spoke with other tongues. Many people say, well, is it for everybody? The Bible very plainly tells us they were all filled, uh, spoke with tongues. Now, everyone's baptism is going to be different, just like everyone's salvation experience is different. Some people will say, well, I don't think I got the baptism because... So-and-so had such a dramatic experience, but mine wasn't. Mine was just real quiet. 
Don't judge yours by anyone else's experience. Paul had a very dramatic salvation on the road to Damascus. And yet another person might have a very quiet, uh, gentle experience with the Lord. So it doesn't have anything to do with how dramatic it is. It has to do with asking the Lord for it in faith. And uh, I got born again at age five when the Holy Spirit came into my heart, and it was real. But it was years later that I was in a hotel room in, uh, in New Orleans when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was a very quiet, very gentle, very sweet experience. And I can still remember just feeling a love that just engulfed me like I'd never experienced before. It was just, it was almost indescribable. Jesus uh, was so real to me at that moment, even though it was just a very quiet, gentle experience. Now, Jack received his baptism and his prayer tongue while he was asleep, and he, he woke up speaking in tongues, you know. I've read testimonies, however, where they, uh, they described lights and dramatic, a, a very dramatic encounter. But that doesn't make mine less real or somebody else is more real. We had one friend that we prayed for for the baptism, and he said, well, I didn't get it because I didn't get my tongues. Well, the next day at work, he was working on a big tractor tire. And he had his head inside that tire looking for the leak, and he said he was just singing praise songs to the Lord when suddenly uh, he wasn't singing praise songs with English. He was, uh, he was singing in his prayer tongue, and oh my, he got so excited. So don't doubt your experience. Once you ask for it, and, and you, you're going to receive it, you know, and the evidence of speaking in tongues will finally come. Every child of God thinks the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, it, it's just different for them. And yours is going to be more precious to you than anyone else's because it, it's yours. But you're going to find out that every single time that a person gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they do get their prayer tongue. The prayer tongue is there. It, they may not get it right at that moment for some kind of uh, inhibition, but it's going to be there. It's going to come. Now, some people out of fear or whatever, they're hindered uh, to, to let it flow forth at first. But don't let that panic you because it's there. Just relax and trust God and it, it'll flow out. Now, a lot of people want to know, well, do you go into some kind of trance, you know? Uh, do you just feel like you've been overpowered? Well, that's a big fear of a lot of people. But in Acts 2 verse 4, it says, they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we do the speaking. The Spirit gives us the utterance, but we're the one in control of our tongue. We're in control of, of the language that comes out. And there's no trance. It's a teamwork between us and the Holy Spirit. He gives the utterance, but we're the one now that does the talking. And we decide how loud, how soft, you know, uh, how fast or how slow we're going to talk because we're the one in control. And people need to get rid of the fear that something's going to overtake them and they're going to be out of control. God doesn't do it that way. We're the one in control. 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And we need to realize that uh, our prayer tongue, our, our, our walking in the spirit, it's subject to us. The gift is subject to the one who is operating the gift. Now, God doesn't force anything on us. Now, some people will say, well, how do you know if it's for today? I heard that it went out with the apostles. And a lot of people have heard that. A lot of people believe that. In fact, some people think that the Bible tells you that it went out with the apostles. I can assure you that's not in the Bible, so don't waste your time looking for it, you know. But if you look at Acts 2, verse 38, thinking that uh, tongues passed away with the apostles is an incorrect tradition of men that... Uh, try to make you think that it's already passed away and, and it, it, it frightens them. But the Word of God very plainly says that it's for us today. In Acts 2, 38 and 39, Peter said, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift then of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. He says it's for you denoting the individual. It's for your children. That denotes that it's for the succeeding generations. And then he says it's for all that are far off, denoting it's for all nations and all nationalities, anyone who, who will receive the Lord 
and receive it. And then he added, just in case anyone's left off, he said, it's for as many as the Lord God shall call unto himself. Wow. Now, God could not have made it any clearer. Every single person who is open and wanting all that God has now for him will be drawn to this baptism at one time or another. He'll be drawn to it. You can quench the drawing. You can say no until you no longer feel it. But that drawing's there. The, Lord, the Lord's the one that's drawing us by his Holy Spirit. But every person open to Jesus will at one time or another be drawn to the baptism. Now, in Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus is speaking to the church at Laodicea. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in and I'll sup with him. Now, a lot of people have used that as a salvation scripture. And they think that Jesus is standing at the door and he says, If you'll open the door, I'll come in. And they think that he's inviting them in for salvation. But that's not a salvation scripture. He was actually writing to the church, and he was speaking to, uh, to Christians. He was asking them to open the door when he knocked. And this is an invitation from the Lord to invite us into a deeper walk with him. He's saying, I, I'm standing at the door. You know, I'm knocking. Open the door. Let me come, come in. Let, let me give you a deeper walk. And every person who gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, he, he, he wants them to come on in, receive more and more. And practically every time, if you ask them what they were praying before this happened, they'll say, okay, I was just saying, Lord, I want all you've got, you know. Or they'll be saying, Lord, I, I just pray for more of you. It's always when we're asking for more. And what they were doing, they were opening the door when Jesus knocked on their heart's door and asking to come in and sup with them. Now, when we sup or when we eat with someone, we're fellowshipping with them. We're, we're getting to know them better. He doesn't just want to be our ticket to heaven. He wants to fellowship with us more intimate, in a more intimate way than we've ever experienced before. And that's why he said, I'm standing at the door knocking. You know, let me in. I'm going to give you more. I've always got more for you. Now, many people want to know, how do I get it now? Well, it's very clear in Luke 11, 9 through 13. And I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, then say some people get it and some don't. Everyone who asks is going to receive. And he who seeks it is going to find it. And to him who knocks, God's going to see to it that the door's opened. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He's not going to give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for a, an egg, uh, he's not going to give him a scorpion. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it's for everyone. He's making it very clear. If you want it, it he's, he'll open the door. He'll give the Holy Spirit to everyone who asks for it. Now, every question that you can come up with concerning the baptism has an answer in the Bible. You can't come up with a question. I have people who they're thinking about asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they have so many questions. Every one of those questions are answered in the Word of God. And verse 9 is the universal way of receiving anything from the Lord. He makes it so simple. God's ways are so simple. You know, it's ask, seek, and knock. That's, that's basically uh, the answer he gives us for anything we're looking for. Keep knocking, you know, and, um, but it has to be sincere. Now, he makes it very clear that the way we receive the Holy Spirit always is just to ask. Now, the fact that he used the term Father and not God here is very significant. It denotes that the ones doing the asking already had a relationship with him. A stranger doesn't ask uh, uh, for the Holy Spirit. It's that child asking his father for it. Then some people get into the fear that they ask and then they get a counterfeit. We had one young couple years ago at our church. They came and we prayed for them for the baptism. And boy, they were so excited. But later that afternoon, their college professor said, Oh, I knew someone once who asked and they got a counterfeit. And this little couple got into all kinds of fear, and suddenly they decided they didn't want anything to do with it anymore because it might be a tragedy, and uh, it might be a counterfeit. Well, God makes it so clear here that when you ask for this from the Father, you can know that you're going to get the, right, the real thing. You don't have to be afraid when you're asking the Father. He's not going to give you—you can ask for an egg, and he's not going to give you a bad gift instead. 
And uh, he makes that very clear in Luke 11, 11 through 13. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Is he going to give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he's asked for an egg, is he going to give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You know, if you go to your heavenly Father, you never have to be afraid you're going to get a counterfeit. Now, anyone who gets something other than the real baptism, uh, they had to have gone to a source other than God because God says, <clears throat> if your earthly father gives good gifts, how much more will I, your heavenly father, now give you good gifts? Now, I've heard people say, well, I don't want the baptism. I know so-and-so, uh, and uh, <clears throat> he got the baptism, and he acts just exactly like the world. He's as carnal, he's as immature as, as they come. So I don't want what he's got. Well, we all make a mistake of looking at people, but God never intended us to look at someone else and compare. Because Romans 11 verse 29 says, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He doesn't take them back. In other words, when someone happens to misuse or abuse God's gift, he doesn't take it away from them. I mean, when they ask for it sincerely and got it, then they can misuse it and abuse it and God lets it happen, you know. If I were God, I'd take it back from them after they misused it, but he doesn't do that. So there will be times when you find someone ministering or operating in the gifts of the Spirit, and you're going to be disappointed in their lifestyle or, or maybe disappointed in their misuse or, or their abuse of some of the things of God. But God doesn't want us to get our eyes over on people. If you saw a Ford car going down the street and it was bumping into curbs and side-swiping cars... It, it'd be ridiculous to say, I'm never going to buy a Ford. Just look how that guy's driving his car. You just look at that crazy driver and think, what's wrong with him? But unfortunately, a lot of Christians have a way of judging the gift by the user of the gift. And that's so wrong. Okay, now we're going to stop here. And the next time we're going to look at a few more examples. And then nine important blessings from the baptism of the Holy Spirit.